Thanks everyone for coming to the fifth Craftsbury webinar of the season. Um, nice to see so many people here. Uh, please, a reminder, keep yourself muted uh, throughout. We want to avoid the distraction of background noise and with over a hundred people, there's probably some of that going on for at least some of your households. Um, I, I want to I want to start with acknowledgments, lest I forget to make them, which is common once one gets rolling. Um, and I'll pull up my keynote presentation. And scroll all the way up to the top. Some there we go. Um, you know, first and foremost, I, I, should, uh, I should thank the Craftsbury Outdoor Center. Um, we, we have a commitment to collaborative coaching and we, we learn a great deal from each other and listening to the different ways that we all have of describing uh, different parts of the rowing stroke and different fundamentals of sculling. Um, we would not be the coaches that we are without each other's contribution. Um, there's going to be a lot of Rick Ricky in this presentation. Hopefully I will rep represent him accurately and I know that he will let me know if I don't at, uh, at the end of the presentation or maybe tomorrow with an e <coughs> excuse me, email or phone call. Uh, always Kevin McDermott, um, without whom my first presentation would never have happened. His offhand remark uh, during a doc talk back in about 2010 about you've got to own this space uh, really got me thinking about how to help people get comfortable in the boat more uh, more quickly. Um, John and Peter Graves, Ben Dan, uh, first generation green racing project athletes and quite a few more as well and uh, GRP alum and their their teammate and now head coach of the green racing project Steve Welpley. Uh, this, this presentation would not exist at, as, as the first one that I did in the first week would not exist without Kevin McDermott's offhand remark. Uh, this one would not exist without Tom Terhar's offhand remark at a coaching conference where I went to his presentation and, uh, he, at, at one point he said, rhythm is free speed. It sustains the athlete when she's tired. And, you know, it, it like, like most things pertaining to rowing, it wasn't as though I'd never heard something like that before or, or thought it before, but to hear it articulated in a way that resonates with you, sometimes it takes years. I, I know that most of the people on this, on this call have probably had the experience of hearing the same thing said by 12 different coaches on 12 different occasions, and the 13th, it just works, and it the what what you didn't understand the first 12 times uh is crystal clear all of a sudden um and of course all of the uh now now multiple thousands of craftsbury sculling guests over the years uh both the ones that i have worked with and all those that came in the 44 years before um i'm gonna make this full screen yep okay so We'll get right into it. Um, I'm actually gonna start this webinar with a skiing story because I've, I've learned a great deal about sculling by learning to Nordic ski here at the Outdoor Center. I had never put on a pair of Nordic skis uh, until about in the mid 90s and that was in Duluth, Minnesota and I did that once and didn't do it again until I got to Craftsbury in 2009. Uh, you know, intuitively, you might think you live in a warmer climate, you have an opportunity to row more miles, you're at a tremendous advantage in learning to skull. And I, I haven't found that to be the case. I'm not saying it's a disadvantage to live in a warm climate where you can skull all the time. But I also don't think it's necessarily a disadvantage to live in a, in a climate that has four seasons where you can't skull year round. Uh, I've, I've learned a great deal about sculling from Nordic skiing. I won't belabor that today, but I, I do want to tell this brief story. Um, there's a, there's a, a small hill on one of our core trails uh, called Dinosaur Hill, or Dino for short, and it's, it's not anything intimidating, but it's, it's just long enough and just steep enough that when 
rowers who ski but are not skiers are skiing behind Nordic skiers who are elite Nordic skiers, they either drop us off the back or they get to the top of the, the crest of the hill a lot less gassed than we do. And I was, I was skiing just behind a couple of our GRP rowers one day. I, I think that it was uh, Pete and John Graves, at least that's the way I've been telling the story. And one of them can correct me if they ever hear the story and say, ah, it wasn't us. But there was, there was a very brief exchange between them and one of them said, you know, it's interesting. A lot of times when you're skiing and you add effort, you don't get any faster. And there was a brief pause. And the other one said, yeah, actually, sometimes you add effort and you get slower. And that was the whole of the conversation. But I thought it was a, I thought it was sort of a characteristic rowers conversation, because I think that as, as a culture, at least in the United States, we, we have a great deal of faith in, in raw effort, that if you, if you add effort, it, it may not always be the most efficient effort, but it's going to make you faster. And that, that can be a, a useful thing. It's, it's viscerally satisfying to honk on it and to, and to know that you're, you're having to earn every inch of run and that you're... Um, you're emptying the tanks and there, we, 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 we ascribe a lot of virtue to that. Uh, but the other side of the coin is that it's worth asking whether that's the, the optimal way to make a boat go fast, whether that's the optimal way to, to move a boat. So um, I, this, this next slide deals with that, that same theme. Uh, I sort of imagined uh, a young rower encountering the title of this presentation and saying free speed if it's free i don't want it i want to have to earn it um we we have this this work ethic sport and and the allure of that sport is of that work ethic idea you have to earn everything and if you work hard you will you will be rewarded proportionally uh that's not to be underestimated um there was, there was another conversation a little bit later in that same season between a couple of GRP rowers. And again, I don't know for sure who it was, uh, but there was, there was a skier who, or a, a GRP rower who was skiing, um, who was remarking on how much speed he had gotten out of a little technical uh, shift that one of the GRP skiers had helped him make a few minutes before. And one said to the other, I, I, don't, I don't trust it. And he said, you know, it's, it's too easy. I'm going faster and it's easier and I, and I don't trust it. And the other one said to him, well, yeah, that, that's, that's exactly right. Good technique is the devil's way of tricking you into thinking you don't have to work as hard. And I thought, again, that's, that's, a, very, that's a very characteristic rower's conversation. Um, I, I think that, you know, Nordic skiers have their... Uh, passed out, threw up, couldn't stand up after the race stories, and, and they're proud of them too. But I, I really think that as, as, a, as a rule, when a, when a, when a cross-country skier is, is going really fast, he's more apt to think, cool, I'm going really fast. And when a, when a rower is going really fast, he, he asks, okay, I'm going really fast, but it doesn't feel hard enough. What can I do to make this hurt the way it's supposed to? And you know that that may or may not be a fair a fair thing to say, but uh, it there it is. Um, so framing the issue of free speed, um, you know what are we talking about? Free speed could be more speed with the same effort, or free speed could be the same speed with less effort. Um, I've already covered this slide, so I I won't belabor it. Um, core principles uh, to me, not just of this, this presentation specifically, but just sort of in general. Um, when you're training for sculling or rowing or really any sport, it's important to remember that you're, you're training the nervous system. You're not just increasing your lung capacity or your muscles ability to contract or your heart's ability to pump blood. It's, it's not 
it's not just a it's it's not just a physiological process of improvement it's also a neurological process of improvement especially if you keep that in mind um number two any interruption of the stroke cycle however subtle is going to interrupt the law the interrupt the run of the boat that's a simple idea uh just as simple as the law of conservation of momentum but i i think we pay too little attention to its importance uh, the third point is a, is a quotation from Steve Fairburn, the legendary uh, Aussie coach who spent most of his career coaching in Great Britain. Uh, he was fond of frequently saying, at least if, if his writings are to be believed, if you can't do it easily, you can't do it at all. And there'll, there'll be a, another slide uh, with a similar, um, similar theme from, from Moshe Feldenkrais, who's another of my favorites to quote in terms of, of uh, learning better movement. Um, you know, when, when Fairburn says, if you can't do it easily, you can't do it at all, uh, he doesn't mean take it easy. He means don't waste your effort on things that aren't going to, to move the boat. Um, you know, you can, you can make it hard or you can make it less hard and the choice is sort of up to you. So yeah, here's, here's uh, this, this isn't the quotation I was thinking of, but one, one from Moshe Feldenkrais that I think is very important to the themes that are gonna be sort of in the background of this whole presentation. Uh, no one can learn to ride a bicycle or swim without allowing the time necessary to assimilate the essential and to reject the unintended and unnecessary efforts that the beginner performs in his ambition not to feel or appear inadequate to himself. Um, we, we want to succeed right away. And so sometimes often we, we apply greater effort to ensure that we get the result that we're after, even if it's not the, the optimal or best way to do something We're we're impatient with the process of mastery. And we, we want quick evidence that uh, I'm, I'm succeeding. I want to succeed today, not tomorrow, not next week, not next, not, not, not next month. And you know, to, to, to paraphrase him or to, to, uh, to synopsize it, Feldenkrais is saying you've, you've got to embrace the process. You've got to embrace being a novice uh, even when you're not a novice and keep trying to improve the movement uh, such that it's not entirely effort dependent. Okay, um, now, now we get into uh, Rick Ricky's thinking. Um, Rick likes to talk a lot about uh, changing the paradigm, changing the way that you, you view sport, specifically sculling and rowing. And one of the things that he has said, uh, it, both in my presence and, and the presence of a lot of other people is that this, this sport is about motion, not effort. Yeah, you have to put energy into the system, but expending energy itself is not the end goal. Moving the system is the end goal. And I, I wanna keep that sort of uh, on the back burner, but near to what we're thinking of and talking of as we go through the rest of these slides. Um, speaking of shifting the paradigm, uh, we, had a, we had a doc talk early in our uh, ongoing U23 camp. We have a, a number of U23 athletes who came up to Craftsbury this summer because they could stay long enough to quarantine and, and run a, a, a safe um, training experience. Uh, and in any event, during this doc talk, uh, Nicole Ritchie, who's, uh, who's one of the three coaches along with uh, Steve Welpley and I for the U23s this summer, she, she asked the athletes to think of the rowing stroke more as a gymnastic movement rather than as a, a heavy weightlifting movement like a deadlift. Um, and I thought, well, okay, that, that's, an interesting, that's an interesting way to look at it and probably a valuable one. Uh, and I could, I could mention um, Rick's, Rick's pole vaulter as, a, as another, uh, another example of, of changing your perspective on, on what, the, what the sport is and, and how to perform it. But let, let's stick to gymnastics for a minute and take it a step further. Uh, if you wanted to turn gymnastics into an endurance event, 
that would be analogous to a rowing race, well, the first thing you might do is find a gymnastic movement to perform 240 times consecutively because there are about 240 strokes in a race. So imagine a gymnast or a bunch of gymnasts needing to do 240 consecutive backflips and to stick every single landing of the 240 and to do it in as little time as possible. Well, each of those flips is gonna require putting X amount of energy into the system. And the gymnast wouldn't consider adding more because you, you, wanna, you wanna land on your feet, right? So, I mean, I guess you could jump a little higher to make the backflip, but each of those backflips is gonna be a, a similar in energy expenditure, but it has to be very precisely done or you'll bobble, you won't stick the landing, you won't be prepared to make the next backflip, it'll take you longer to make the next backflip. And you know, keep, keep that sort of allegory in mind as we proceed here. Um, yet another thing to think about, if you're, if you're involved in a sprint race, if you get off the stake boats, get off the starting line clean and you don't catch any diggers and it's a, it's a good clean start, you're gonna reach your peak boat speed somewhere between the fifth and the seventh stroke of the race. And un unless you are deliberately holding back and why would anyone do that in a, in a sprint race with a stake boat, you're not gonna get any faster than you went on strokes five, six, and seven. So your job for strokes eight through 240 is to maintain that speed. And yet a lot of times you see athletes and it looks like they, they, they're rowing as though they have to restart the boat from zero or perhaps save humanity from, from imminent destruction with every single stroke they take. And that's, uh, I, would, I would posit that's potentially wasteful of energy. And anybody who's had the experience of flying and dying can, can probably relate to that. Um, back to Tom Terhar's quotation, rhythm is free speed. It sustains the athlete when she's tired. Elimination of the superfluous is also free speed. You see beginning scholars, and there's a lot of movement in their sculling that does not need to be there. Good sculling above all looks simple, uh, even though it's not, it's, it's quite a complex movement, but when it's done well, it looks simple. Um, it looks relentlessly horizontal. Uh, so elimination of the superfluous is free speed. Cleverness around the transitions, by which I mean the transition from the, 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 drive, to the, re the drive to the release, uh, the entry and catch and the, and the release finish slash, yeah. And um, uh, we, if, if, I, if I wanna, if I wanna uh, credit Rick, I'm gonna call that the water phase of the stroke and the air phase of the stroke rather than the drive and the recovery. And uh, sometimes, sometimes language is important and it changes the way that, that, uh, that your thought process of the sport is colored. Um, elimination of most vertical motion. Uh, obviously in the sculling stroke, the rowing stroke, your knees have to move vertically. There's, there's no getting around that. If you're gonna use your slide, your knees are gonna move vertically. Um, your hands, have to move the handles vertically, but that's a pretty small movement. Uh, so the more you can eliminate vertical motion or needless vertical motion, the more relentlessly horizontal your stroke's gonna be, the more uh, simple your stroke is going to look. Um, feathering and squaring, if you involve the wrists a lot, that tends to introduce a lot of vertical motion. If you, if you uh, have uh, something round the TV remote, uh, you know, maybe, maybe you have a, a sculling handle sitting right in front of you right now, although I, uh, that's probably wishful thinking, but um, if, if you put that in your hand and you manipulate it with your fingers, you'll see that manipulating that, that round object or that cylindrical object with your fingers introduces very little vertical motion. And if you manipulate it with your wrist, you'll find that that handle or that remote or that dry erase marker, it moves up and down quite a lot. So it, it behooves us to simplify our blade work by, by making it as, as little a, 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 a wrist dependent motion uh, 
and, and find a way to keep the handles traveling in their nice horizontal planes around the arcs rather than allowing vertical motion to creep in. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and read through this slide, even though it's, it's largely a redundancy from, from previous slides. But when, when we talk about free speed, what we're really talking about is setting aside superfluous things and things that are making us less efficient, things that are counterproductive, things that are not needed. Um, good sculling looks simple. Okay, back to Moshe Feldenkrais. Uh, speaking of speaking on this topic, the superfluous is as bad as the insufficient, only it costs more. Every motion that you make that does not directly contribute to the moving of the system, by which I mean the boat, the oars, and the sculler, uh, every, every, every needless movement you make costs a little bit of energy. So why not set that aside? Don't make the needless motion and you don't expend that energy unnecessarily, and that's free speed. Um, I often tell the, the, a story about a sculptor, and I really need to look this up because I think it was a specific sculptor that was asked, but uh, for, for, the, for the purposes of, of the point of the story, uh, a sculptor was asked by a non-sculptor, an appreciative non-sculptor, how, how do you look at a block of marble and see what, you, what, what the sculpture is going to look like? How do you get from the block of marble to the sculpture? And the sculptor allegedly said, you know, if you've got a block of marble and you're, you're going to sculpt an elephant, you just start chipping away everything that doesn't look like an elephant. And the process of learning to skull well is somewhat analogous to that. You start with, uh, you start with a lot of things that don't look like sculling and you gradually set aside or chip away all of those things that don't look like good sculling and what you are left with at the end of that process is good sculling. Okay, um, I, I want to show just a few minutes or may, maybe not even a few minutes, just a couple of minutes of uh, what has been my favorite international race for many years and I've, I've seen a lot of good ones since uh, and I, I always keep coming back to this one uh, because it, it's very illustrative of where, of where free speed will put you and of where needless effort will put you. So let's hope this comes up. It worked like a charm when I rehearsed it earlier. Here we go. All right. And let's go to... season um, and uh, certainly from Knakova and certainly from Germany but uh, what I'm interested in seeing really is the Olympic champion Carsten to see whether my guess. Okay so a lot of you probably know the cast of characters in this race. Uh, out front right now you have Mirka Knapkova and this is 2004 and she would go on to win the Olympics uh, I believe 2012 but in any event, um, she's, she's sculling really beautifully here and very rhythmically and very simply. And for that matter, so is Katrin Rutschau, who is pictured here in the blue boat. And over the, over the course of this race, uh, they're, they're both going to scull very well and Rutschau is eventually going to, to uh, win the race by open water. But just look, look at how, how simple and how, how little superfluous motion. And really, you can, you can see that in all four of the leaders at this point in the race. And of course, Ekaterina Karsten and uh, Rumyana Nekova are both great champions in their own right. But as this, as this race wears on, uh, Rutschau's technique doesn't break down. Her, her commitment to simplicity and free speed doesn't break down. She doesn't start laboring 
Um, and I, I'm absolutely not disparaging anyone in this race. They're all fantastic scholars, but you can really begin to see how how this, the, 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 the story that this race tells about what Ruchow hangs on to and what is, what is lost a bit in the scholars that finish behind her. So I will, oh, I didn't intend to stop sharing my screen. I intended to just stop the video. All right. We'll go back to the slideshow. If I can remember how to get there. Okay. All right. Um, I I gave a, a presentation on rhythm at a coaching conference uh, about seven or eight years ago, and it it contained some elements of of this presentation, um, but uh, not it was was not nearly as comprehensive and i i heard a couple of coaches um both before and after the presentation sort of grumbling you, know, you can't coach rhythm can't can't be done you know people either have rhythm or they don't have rhythm and my my response to that uh at least internally was well okay the earth is flat and um i i, I don't i don't know what to tell you of course you can coach rhythm if, if you can create a change in your stroke cycle, and you, and you can, that's going to change the rhythm of your stroke cycle. Any change you make to your sculling is going to have an effect on your stroke rhythm. So if you can make a change to your, your stroke cycle, you can make a change to your rhythm. If you can make a change to your rhythm, it's obviously coachable. Anything you change is going to affect your stroke rhythm. So we'll go with that for a little while. Um, I've already quoted Tom several times. Uh, but I, I will note, um, traditional drills by and large don't tend to address rhythm or, or address it very effectively. Uh, and something that, uh, something that I've used for years is in, instead, of, instead of drills, give a group of athletes a specific thing to focus on that you think will promote a good rhythmic stroke and periodically stop and have the athletes reflect on how their stroke cycle felt different than it feel than than their than their baseline habitual rowing feels and there's 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 not a right answer if you have a group of six scholars out and and you give them all the same exercise and say okay we're going to take 50 strokes and at the end of that 50 strokes i want you to tell me what felt different uh, you're probably going to get six different responses. And two of the athletes may think that the exercise was incredibly helpful. And two of the athletes may think, when I tried that, my whole stroke fell apart. And two of the athletes may have something unique and different to say. It's, it's a process of experimentation and, and feeling the differences is itself the point of the process. So same exercise, producing different results for different athletes, that's a good thing. The, the point of the process to, is to feel something different. Um, if it works, if it makes a positive change in your stroke cycle, great, keep it, remember it. If it doesn't, set it aside, discard it, try it again later. Um, I, I almost hesitate to give a list because you could, you could make a list of, of suggested exercise for this, purpose, for this purpose, and it could be 200 items long. But just a few of the ones that I, that I tend to use over and over again, the, the, the first one that I use almost always is just ask, the, just ask the athletes to focus on keeping their hands in constant motion. Um, and I, I don't prescribe fat, keep your hands in constant fast motion, keep your hands in constant slow motion. I just say, keep your hands in constant motion. Um, if, if you want to, you can say, you know, appropriate to the rating and the speed of the boat. But typically, when, when you give athletes this exercise, the most common response that you get when you stop them and ask is, gosh, it, it, felt, it felt too fast. I, you know, I felt like I was going too fast. And you know, chances are the reason for that is that they had a little hitch somewhere in their stroke or a pause in their stroke. And it, it's, a, it's a teachable moment to say, I, I didn't tell you to speed up. So could you do that again? And, and 
and pick a speed that didn't make you feel hurried. You know, you said, you said it made you feel a little hurried. It felt too fast. Okay. Could you do it again and have it be a tempo that doesn't feel too fast? Um, fo focus on next, next one, maybe focus on getting the hands to maintain a constant speed on the recovery. That's not the same thing as the first exercise because the first exercise is focused on the whole stroke cycle. The second exercise is, is focused solely on the recovery. Um, squaring the blades tends to interrupt the flow of the hands for a lot of scholars. If you focus on getting the hand hands to maintain a constant speed, maybe you figure out a way to square the blades without interrupting your, your, uh, the process of your recovery. Um, let, let the hands away segment set the speed, maintain it. Uh, you, so uh, third one, focus on going straight to the entry. I'm, I'm stealing that one directly from Jim Joy. I, I heard him do this one with, uh, with a, a couple of eights at Southern Methodist University in the late 90s. Uh, they were hanging at the catch and he said, okay, for the, next, for the next few minutes, I just want you to focus on going straight to the entry. Don't think about squaring your blade, no hesitation, just go straight to the entry and find out what that does for you. Um, that's going to produce a change in your stroke rhythm unless you're already doing it. Focus on finding the water with the bottom edge of the blade. A lot of people skull as though they're trying to put the, the front face of the blade in first, or they're trying to back the blade in, put the back, back face of the blade in first. So change the athlete's focus from, from one face of the blade to the bottom edge of the blade or to the leading edge of the blade that theoretically should find the water first. See what it does. Um, I'm gonna talk about this a little bit at a little bit greater length a little later, but uh, blade acceleration drill. Um, ask them to catch at something considerably less than full pressure and to, to build to three quarter pressure, build to 90%, build to full pressure, something that's less to more. Um, catch at something less than full pressure, release at full pressure, or catch at something less and release at something more. Uh, focus on keeping the pressure on the handles constant. Focus on increasing the pressure on the handles from drive to release. You're going to get two slightly different results out of that. Which one works better for you? Um, again, there's, no, there's not necessarily a right answer or a universal, oh, this is going to work for, for all athletes. There's no one size fits all. Uh, focus on accelerating through the release, not just to the release. A lot of people get stuck at the finish. Uh, they, they take a, there's, there's always the, the, the great debate between the micro pause versus the hands around the conveyor belt. Uh, sometimes you see athletes, they're not, they're not micro pausing. They're pausing long enough to take a nap, have a sandwich and admire their work and then take another stroke. So focus on acceleration through the release, not to the release. That's not prescriptive. That's just something to try. Uh, focus on getting your nose to follow your hands around the release. If you've been taught sequentially, arms away, body over, then on the slide, maybe, maybe, your, maybe your recovery could, could use a bit more effective blending. Think about the nose following the hands. The hands lead, the nose follows. Uh, it doesn't have to be robotic and sequential. Everybody who's watched video of good rowing and good sculling knows that the answer to, well, is it sequential or is it blended? Yes to both. It is sequential. It is blended. You don't want to get things in the wrong sequence. You don't want to do them in, in isolation. That creates a robotic stroke. Um, focus on seat handle timing at the catch. Make sure that your handles and your, and your seat begin moving at the same time. Focus on uh, making sure that you're not on the handles before you're on the foot stretchers. Focus on making sure that you're not on the foot stretchers before the blades are in the water. Um, focus on shifting the body, body weight out of bow with cleverness. Again, this is not a prescriptive list of 11. There's, there's hundreds and hundreds of these. Anything that you, can, that you can dream up as a potential focus is probably gonna have a noticeable effect on the athlete's stroke rhythm, and it'll probably be different for, for different athletes. Okay. Um, framing this for the athletes uh, as you start the process, if this, is part of, if this is part of a practice that you're leading, um, in every case, if you don't tell them to make the exercise their sole focus, 
the overthinkers in the group are going to get sidetracked because they're going to start thinking, oh, I'm feathering, I'm feathering while my blade's still in the water. Oh, I'm not squaring early enough. I don't care if you're feathering while your blade's still in the water right now. Just focus on, on, the, on the point of the exercise. Um, all other facets of the stroke need to happen automatically. If stray thoughts creep in that don't relate to the, to the exercise you've given them, the athlete should either set them aside and refocus or stop and start again. Um, and it's, it's hard for people who want to build Rome in a day, who want to fix everything, but, 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 but no buts. One focus, just, just get your mind around that one thing and then tell me what it does. Okay. Um, shifting gears. Uh, another, another quotation that has stuck with me. Unfortunately, it didn't stick with me verbatim and I spent uh, a very tense 30 or 40 minutes trying to find the exact quotation. It was, it was in rowing, rowing news back in a, uh, like 2000, late 2004 or 2005. Uh, Brian Volpenheim, who had stroked the U.S. 8 to victory in 2004, uh, said something. I'm, I'm going to paraphrase him, um, but Br Brian is sort of his, his reputation is sort of being a, a wizard of, of stroke rhythm. And he said something about that in rowing news along the lines of you get the rhythm in the water, or maybe he said, I found, I found the rhythm with the blades in the water. But the idea is that rhythm is primarily derived from what happens while the blades are in the water rather than from what happens on the recovery. And that's, that runs counter to, I think sort of the dominant, thought that people have about rhythm, which is that rhythm is largely either, either created by a controlled slide on the recovery, or it is destroyed by an uncontrolled slide on the recovery. And so you get this, you, you get the, the coxswain's constant cry of slow down the slide or uh, what, what have you. Um, I think we rushed the slide largely because we didn't perform the drive and release as well as we should have. Um, Simple math, if you're rowing 20 strokes a minute, you have three seconds to take every stroke. And if you waste a few tenths of a second not, uh, not creating a drive rhythm that's appropriate and not getting the blades out effectively and clearing them at the release, you waste a few tenths of a second, all of a sudden you don't have as much time to get back up to the next front end. And what do we do when we don't have enough time? We rush. Uh, so you wanna create an effective stroke rhythm. I, I think it starts with how you perform the drive. And uh, the next few slides are gonna be all about that. Um, again, in, in our U23 camp uh, last week, we were, uh, we were playing around with drive rhythm and we, we had a, a conversation about, you know, can you, can you sort of lump drive rhythms into a, f a handful of categories? And what we came up with was that there are three really common drive rhythms that if you, if you look at any given sculler, you can sort of characterize their drive rhythm as, as being in one of these three categories. And they, you know, there's, there's some overlap, but uh, this, this is what we came up with as our framework. Um, the, the hit it and quit it, uh, a very aggressive start to the drive and a not, not as aggressive or maybe even a passive uh, end to the drive. Um, you see this a lot in novices and, and people who haven't taken a lot of strokes. Um, uh, my, my theory is that the reason this is most common among beginning scholars is that we, we know that our legs are stronger than our arms. And so we think I'm, I'm using my legs first in the drive, which is itself a problematic concept uh, that this presentation will not delve into. Uh, Rick would love it if I did, but I don't, I, I don't have the time or, or, the, or the preparation for it. But we, we trust our legs to do work. And so we, we do a lot of work in the first part of the drive and we, we, we fail to sustain that through the end of the drive. And so you, you, you fall into the trap of thinking that because your blades are still in the water, you're still propelling the boat, but that's not necessarily true. If you stop accelerating the handles or you or maybe accelerating isn't the right word. If, if, if you don't keep the handles loaded throughout the drive, then 
you're, you're literally putting the brakes on the boat because the boat wants to accelerate while you are no longer accelerating the system. So the hit it and quit it, the more to less drive, promising beginning, passive ending, uh, it, it creeps into a lot, e even some pretty good scholars rowing when they go on the paddle. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna argue today that your basic stroke rhythm ought to have a, a great deal in common across every stroke rate and across every pressure and across every intensity and situation. Even on the paddle, you're still trying to send the boat. You're sending it with a lot less intensity, but the drive still needs to be less to more. And I'm, I'm giving away my bias that I wasn't gonna give away for another slide or two, but it's probably obvious as it is. Um, the second kind of drive that we, that we came up with as our framework was the, the bang and try to hang. Um, a vain, to, a vain attempt at starting with more and finishing with more. Well, that's absurd. If you're gonna hit, if you're gonna hit it as hard as you can right off the front end, what are you gonna do for an encore? And I'm, I'm stealing that, that uh, phrase from, from Peter Mallory's first book. Um, I think it's called an out of boat experience, but Peter's, Peter's a big fan of the, the less to more drive. Uh, and it's, it's actually a light motif of his four volume uh, exhaustive and outstanding history of rowing uh, that that less to more drive and and the, the uh, argument of its superiority runs through that that whole four volumes along with a lot of really good history but um, the the bang and try to hang is uh, okay I'm gonna start with more and I'm gonna finish with more I'm just by God gonna I'm gonna put energy into the system right from the right from the beginning and I'm gonna sustain it all the way to the release and you know, you, you, you attack the leg drive and you try to sustain the load all the way through. And it can be very effective. There, there've been a lot of races won by a lot of, a lot of very fit and determined crews with the, the bang and try to hang drive rhythm. Um, but I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna assert that it's, it's wasteful of energy and it's not in keeping with what the system wants to do. Um, I'll, this, this, this quotation is gonna come up on a later slide, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go with it right now. Um, and I've already uh, quoted Get the Rhythm in the Water or paraphrased Brian Volpenhain. In any event, uh, the, the third common drive rhythm, uh, we called it the suspend and send or the less to more. The, the great debate is, well, how much less, how much more? That's, that's the end, endlessly debatable point, but it, it at least gets us started. Um, this, this story is on another slide, but I think it's fitting to bring it in here. Uh, when, when I was rowing at the University of Virginia, uh, I was lucky enough to be coached by Will Scoggins and Kevin Sauer. And I remember that uh, when, when the eights were just going terribly, if, if nothing was going right, Kevin's go-to drill was always something that he called the blade acceleration drill. And I've, I've already sort of synopsized it earlier, but uh, the, the way that he always set this up was okay, guys, I want you to catch at quarter pressure and release at three quarter pressure, or I want you to catch at half pressure and release at 90%, or I want you to catch at three quarter pressure and release at full pressure. Whatever it was, it was always less to more. And what I noticed over the spring semester of that year was that every time that Kevin called for that drill, the boat started to jump and things got better. It didn't necessarily, it didn't fix everything, but it got better. Inevitably and predictably, less to more made the boat jump. It felt better. And the conclusion that I drew from that over time was that, okay, the blade acceleration drill or the handle acceleration drill, however you want to name it, that's not a drill. That's the way you're supposed to be rowing in the first place. That's the way you're supposed to be sculling in the first place. The drive needs to be less to more. Again, how much less? That's debatable. How much more? Well, in a racing situation, obviously it builds to full pressure. How far below full pressure does it start? How, how patient do you have to be at the front end? Uh, how, how much do you need to, to, to almost, I don't want to use the word weight, but I'm going to. Um, so moving on to the next slide. Um, blade acceleration, handle acceleration. It's a drill that isn't a drill. Um, various ways of talking about this sort of desirable stroke rhythm. Uh, memorable things that I've heard other coaches say at Craftsbury and elsewhere. 
Uh, Dan Rook, who was the, the first full-time coach of the GRP, liked to talk about creating an energetic puddle. And if, if, you, if you don't sustain the load on the blade right up to the moment of release, you're not going to get an energetic puddle. You're not going to get that vortex spinning off the tip of the blade and that satisfying tight, not noisy, but satisfyingly uh, the, the sound of the puddle, the, the feel of the puddle. Create an energetic puddle is, is very helpful. You cannot, get a create, you cannot get an energetic puddle with the hit it and quit it drive rhythm. If you bang the front end and then fail to sustain the load on the blades, you are not going to get an energetic puddle. You might get an energetic puddle out of the, out of the bang and try to hang. You're not going to get it with hit it and quit it. So energetic puddle, useful mnemonic device, useful reminder. Um, something that Steve Welpley, the current GRP coach and uh, GRP alum, as an athlete himself says often, uh, don't start what you can't finish. You're free to load the blades as early and as heavily as, as you uh, think is going to behoove the, the speed of the boat. But if you can't finish it, if you can't sustain that all the way to the moment of release, then you started it with, with too much energy. Um, Something that uh, in, in the run-up to the 2016 Olympic trials, uh, Ben Dan, who I, I believe he rode two seat in that quad uh, at, at trials and throughout most of that season, they switched seats around a little bit, but that doesn't matter what seat he rode. Ben, ben Dan used to talk about uh, when, when I get up to the front end, you know, my, my handles are going to be out over the water. They're going to be outside the gunnels. And as long as my handles are outside the gunnels, I'm going to be patient and I'm going to be content to allow the handles to travel slowly. And once they get back inside the gunnels, that's when I'm really going to start the process of trying to, to load up those handles and load up those pins and load up the blades. Um, and, you know, he's, he's talking about a very fast boat. A lot of times you get into this debate with people and they, they want to say, no, 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 you got you to load the blades right away. Uh, or, or, or common argument is, oh, that's not true in a fast boat in an eight. In an eight, you got to load the blades immediately. You got to you got to bang the catch. Um, but you know, Ben Ben's rowing in a very fast boat. A quad is a an elite quad is a fast boat, and the water is traveling past the hull fast, and the hull is traveling through the water fast. And yet, uh, he's he's committed to this idea of I'm going to be patient as long as the handles are outside the gunnels. I'm going to let my blades find the water, and then I'm going to load up the system. So. Again, uh, our, our, our common bias uh, and leitmotif of, of drive rhythm for this presentation is going to be that attacking the catch is neither the most efficient way to move a boat, nor does it usually produce an ideal stroke rhythm. Um, a, lot, a lot of times you get the sense from, from some athletes, particularly younger athletes, that what they'd like to do is get the blades in the water, and drive them through the water so fast that drive time is reduced to zero or something very close to it. It's like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make the drive take almost no time at all. And you know, it, it, it can't be done. Um, the, blades, the blades have to be in the water long enough for the boat to travel past the blades, and that takes some time. And depending on the stroke rate and the speed of the boat, uh, you know, that, that might be seven tenths of a second. It might be 1.4 seconds, depending on the stroke rate and the speed of the boat and the length of the length of the stroke that the crew is taking. Um, the, the length of time that the blades are in the water is more dependent on the speed that the boat is already traveling and the stroke length than it is on how hard you're pulling. The, the idea, and I, I had this conversation with Dick Dreisigacker once and he said, you know, you know the, the idea that one guy can, can rip the blade through the water faster than another guy in a racing situation uh, in the same boat, it's, that's probably, that's, that's very doubtful. Um, the boat has to travel past the blades. The blades are going to be in the water. Don't, reduce t don't try to reduce drive time to zero. It can't be done. Okay. A um, couple of good stories about trying to create this stroke rhythm. And, you know, I think... I think the, the, most, the most common stroke rhythm among crews that are competing is some variation of the, 
bang and try to hang or bang and try to sustain. And that becomes part of your neurological pattern. If you've taken 700 strokes or 700,000 strokes that way, that's a difficult neurological pattern to break out of. And a, a couple of stories to illustrate that. Um, John Graves and Steve Welpley were rowing a double at some point back in 2013, 14, or 15. And they were working on this, this very idea, this, this concept of the, the less to more drive. And they were, uh, they were doing it as a drill and, and exaggerating or trying to exaggerate the, okay, we want to we catch at half pressure or we want to catch at 20. I think it was 25% as this story goes. We want to catch at 25% and we want to release at full pressure. And uh, John was stroking and, and Steve was rowing bow and he won't mind me telling this story because he tells it on himself all the time. But uh, they, they did this drill for a while and after they stopped to turn around and um, Steve thought he was being really patient at the front end. And John's comment to him was, you know, your 25% off the front end feels like about 80% to me in stroke seat. And, you know, it's like, okay, you, you think you think you're doing it and you're doing it a little, but you're you're not doing it as as much as you think you are. I had I had the same experience myself two years ago. This this uh, this drive rhythm has been a, a big theme around here for for several years, both uh, GRP uh, resident athletes and and sculling guests. Uh, and I was working on it myself because I've I've always been a loaded up bang and try to hang uh, rhythm in my own sculling. Um, and early one summer, there was, uh, uh, Gary Reed was here from, from New Zealand coaching in the camps and he was watching me skull and his, his comment after watching me skull was, you, you like to hit, you like to hit it really hard, uh, right off the front end, right? You like get, get a lot of work done behind the pins. And, uh, I, I didn't, I didn't realize that he was critiquing me, but I said, yeah, I, I like to get a lot of work done behind the pins. And, you know, then, then I started working on the, the, the less to more drive a little bit more. And I, I thought I'd really gotten it. I thought, I, I thought I had the rhythm down. And Noel Warner, uh, one of our associate directors and head coaches was, was out in a, in a launch at the end of a sculling session. And I was out in a single and I'd been coaching for my single and I happened to be next to him. I said, Noel, you know, take a look at me for a minute and tell me what you see. And I didn't prompt him. I didn't give him any, any hints or, or, or spoilers. And after about 90 seconds, he stopped me. And first thing he said was, you're hitting the front end too aggressively. Be, be more patient around the, around the, the entry and the, and the beginning of the drive. And so, you know, that was a little disappointing because I'd been working on it for weeks and I thought I had it down. And I, I worked on it for the rest of the summer. And near the end of the summer, uh, Pete Graves was there and was out on a coaching launch. And I did the same thing with him I'd done with Noel. I said, Pete, you know, take a look at me for a minute or two and tell me what you see. No prompt, no spoiler, no hint. Stops me after a minute or two and says, you're, you're hitting the front end too aggressively. So, you know, changing, changing a neurological habit can be different or can be difficult. But I, I, will, I will say from experience that when I, when I do remember to be really patient and it, it feels almost ridiculously patient to me because it's so foreign to my neurological habit. I get the same splits out of the boat with less effort. And I, I think, okay, why don't I do that all the time? Well, I don't do that all the time because I forget myself. I fall back into my neurological habit and that's, that's just what we do. And it's, it's not, a, it's not, there's no magic dust. It's, it's a process of, of being very focused on it and, and very committed to it over a long period of time. All right, um, I've, I've covered a lot of this slide, uh, but I, I always like to start this one with the, the old quotation from uh, John Wooden, the legendary UCLA multiple national championship winning coach. Um, Be quick, but don't hurry. Um, if you hurry, you're cutting off part of, the, part of the boat's ability to run out. The goal is to get the boat to run as far as it can on each stroke at a given rating. We, we think far too much about moving fast ourselves and not, about, and not enough about moving far with each stroke. Uh, novices 
usually think if they are moving fast, the boat will move fast. Not necessarily true. And even we, 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 we fall into that trap almost inevitably as novices, and we don't get completely immunized to it, uh, maybe ever. Um, really, really outstanding scholars have internalized this idea that it's, it's, it's more about are you moving the system effectively rather than how fast are you yourself moving within the system. When you see really outstanding sculling, even at high ratings, you sort of get the impression visually that the boat and the, the boat and the sculler and the oars are all moving along smartly relative to the horizon. But within the boat, the sculler is not moving as fast relative to the boat as the as the boat and the and the oars and the sculler are moving relative to the horizon. So um, this one, uh, it's it's kind of a departure and it's a it's a one off slide, but when you think of drills for rowing and sculling, um, what are the first drills you think of? And uh, the, 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 desired, it's, the desired response is uh, you, usually, usually you get pick drill and then somebody says pause drills. And I'm not knocking pause drills. Pause drills are incredibly valuable for, for checking your position at each point in the recovery. They're incredibly valuable for learning to, to move your body cleverly and not abruptly and come into the pauses uh, gently and, and so on and so forth. But it has always amused me that in a sport in which arguably the most important thing is continuous, uninterrupted cyclical motion, the most popular drills in that sport involve stopping and starting again. And again, not, not disparaging pause drills. We need pause drills. Their pause drills are greatness, but uh, that, that one's always amused me. So I left the slide in just, just so I could say that and uh, uh, amuse myself. I hope some of you got something out of it as well. All right. Um, getting out of your own way is free speed. Uh, I'm going to go to this graphic that some of you may have seen before, especially if you have been to Craftsbury because we use this a lot. But um, here where my cursor is, uh, when, when you first come to the sport, most of us as spatial thinkers have a tendency to assume that what happens while the blade is in the water is that it moves in a, a semicircular arc. It's just, it's just an arc and, and that's, that's what it is. And at some point, uh, usually fairly early in, in the process of learning to row or learning to skull, a coach will tell you that what happens is not, exact, is not that at all. And that what, what that coach will want you to think about is put the blade in the water and let the boat move past the blade. And a lot of times they use a, a, a post analogy. It's like you're gonna, you're gonna put your blade right behind a post and you're going to use that post as leverage to pry the boat past the post. But that kind of breaks down too because the blade needs to move sideways in the water. And unless the post is also going to move sideways, the blade's not going to stay on the post. So the typical blade path is in the, is in the right hand graphic where my cursor is now. And you see that at the catch, the blade, the blade is if, you, if it enters, uh, well, if you, if you pick the boat up on the run, as we try to do, the blade wants to go that direction first, but the boat is moving, so it quickly goes that direction, and it goes out sideways and comes back toward the boat, goes out away from the boat, comes back toward the boat, and it basically, moving to the, to the third picture, it makes, it inscribes something like a nine in the water. And if you think about it, you know, what, what happens to the sculler who is missing water? What happens to the sculler who is hanging at the catch? Well, the tail of this nine never happens because that sculler is trying to put the front face of the blade in the water and not letting the blade find the water. And if you let the blade find the water, you get a nice tail, comes out and around and comes back toward the boat and you've made a nine. If you hang around too long and leave the blades in the water to the point that you almost get stuck at the release, this nine's gonna have a tail on both ends. And we've, we've been talking a lot about that this week. So um, 
in any event, uh, it, it, it tends to be mind blowing to, to most of us the first time we see what the path of the blade in the water is. And I've, I've had people ask me, um, you know, how does it help me? If I know the path of the blade in the water, how does it help me? And it's, it's worth admitting that quite possibly the majority of athletes that have won the Olympics and won world championships couldn't draw the, the path of the blade in the water. And, and they, they're still champions. Um, but I do think there's an, at, there's an advantage to knowing what the blade wants to do. If you know where the blade wants to go, then you are less likely to try to force it to go where you think it should go. And that's going to have some reduction of, of wasted effort. And as, as we've already uh, covered many times so far in the presentation, uh, the, the absence of wasted effort that's, that's free speed. Um, okay, back to the slideshow. We're, we're, almost, we're almost there. Uh, again, if you have questions for the, for the post slideshow bit of this presentation, uh, please send them to Erica and she will take care of them. Um, in general, it, not without exception, sometimes you, get, you, get, you, can, you can get so long at the entry that uh, Fairburn said something about this, uh, if, if you strive just for length for its own sake, sometimes that, that will create a drag and your, your drive will not be as lively as it should be. But generally speaking, um, modern blades and this drive rhythm that we've been discussing, they like a steep catch angle. So if you have any doubt at all about your arcs, try to get a little longer at the entry and a little shorter at the release. It's nearly always a good idea whether it comes from a deliberate change of technique or from, or from placement of your foot stretchers. Uh, it's, it's not, it's not 100% universal prescription, but if in doubt, see if you can get a little steeper catch angle and uh, don't, don't strive for the, the greatest release angle you can possibly get. Typically, if you're, if you're trying to keep the blades in the water as long as you can possibly keep them in the water, uh, you wind up you wind up with the backside of the blade dragging the water and your, your release isn't as clean as perhaps it should be. Okay, um, relaxation is free speed. It applies to all phases of the stroke, not just the recovery. The recovery, uh, it's, it's aptly named. Um, you can, one of, my, my first coach, uh, Will Scoggins, was fond of saying, Rowers and scullers are the laziest endurance athletes on the planet because they spend more than half of their time in competition resting. And he was talking about the recovery. So you can choose to do a lot of work on the recovery, or you can choose to do exactly as much work on the recovery as it takes to reposition yourself and ready yourself and your blade to take the next catch. Unnecessary tension is, is wasted effort no matter when or where it is. If you're tense on the drive, that, if that tension's not moving the boat, Set it aside, discard it. Uh, suspension is free speed. Um, famous story of the Clemson athletic director who said, uh, I'm, I'm not gonna add rowing to our athletic offerings because I am not gonna spend a penny on a sport in which people sit on their butts and go backward. Well, the idea that rowing is a seated sport is, is actually a, mis it's a, it's a common misconception. Um, ideally, your hips get very light in the seat on the drive. Uh, the, the, the story that is most typically told is it at mid drive, somebody ought to be able to pull a sheet of paper out from between your butt and the seat because your hips are light enough on the seat that you've suspended most of your body weight on the oar handles and the foot stretcher and the pins and gravity is literally helping you prepare or propel the boat. Gravity does not get tired. If you sit on the seat and push and pull, you're going to get tired before you're going to get tired if you can, if you can get gravity to help you out. Um, confidence is free speed. A crew that is rowing confidently is going to go faster than a crew that is rowing with a lack of confidence. Keep that in mind. If you're, if you're warming up for a race and you're just not feeling it, try to remember a time when you, when you performed well and get yourself, remember what that felt like and see if you can reproduce it. Um, Little stuff with big benefits. A truly flat wrist on the drive derived from optimal hand placement is free speed. Uh, it's sort of a sacred cow that you ought to have the handles way out in your fingertips and, and you can go too far with that. Um, 
when, when Linda Murray was here helping us coach the U23s a few years ago, she gave us a tech tip that has stuck with me ever since, and it's been free speed ever since when I can remember to do it. But her, her, um, her contention was that when most people think they have a flat wrist, they actually have a wrist that is slightly dorsiflexed, slightly, slightly flexed upward. And you, they, they think their wrist is flat, but you show it to them on video, and yeah, my wrist is flexed just a little bit. And if you will drape the, the fingers over the oar handle in such a way that the, the knuckles are a little bit further forward than, than your out in the fingertips sort of thing, you wind up, you, it feels like your wrist is flexed downward, but you actually have a flat wrist. So that's something to play around with. A truly prepared blade is free speed. Um, so some people will argue with me about this, but I've found that if, if my blade is fully square, I, I'm, I am not clever enough to find the, the mythical unicorn, and I, I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but uh, the, the sculler's catch in which the water completes the squaring of the blade and the boat looks like it's being drawn forward by a string, um, it's, it's out there, you can do it, but I've, I've found that if I prepare my blade earlier, I get a couple of splits out of that if I remember to do it. Um, I, I don't want to use the phrase lazy front end. Forget that's there. I'm not sending this slideshow out publicly, so uh, it, I guess it'll be on YouTube forever now. Um, elimination of blade travel toward the starting line or the stern after the release is free speed. Um, we tend, most, most scholars tend to roll a little bit of air both at the, at the front end and the back end. And what I mean by that is if you miss water, it may make you feel like you're taking a very long stroke, but if the first three inches of your stroke is rowing air, that's not moving the boat. Um, so there's a difference between perceived length and effective length. And there's a difference between perceived length and effective length at the back end of the stroke as well. If you release the blades and they continue to travel toward the stern, which, you know, it's like the bottom edge of the blade, as it feathers, it travels toward the starting line or toward the stern, that's wasted time. And it may only be a, a, a couple of hundredths of a second, but if you waste a couple of hundredths of a second on every single release, you're wasting a couple of seconds over the course of a race. And why do you want to do that? Um, Larry Gluckman has a lot, of, a lot of great pithy phrases that he uses. I, I really like his for this, for this uh, phenomenon. He says, square out and feather away, by which he means when the blade extraction begins, you want the blade to still be on the square. Don't blend the feather with the release. Get the release to start with the blade still on the square. Feather away confused me the first time I heard it because I thought, okay, feather away. Well, that bottom edge of the blade is traveling toward the stern. That's feathering away. Larry's talking about the handle is traveling away. So if the feather happens while the handle is moving toward the body, then you're wasting that time. You're rowing air at the release. If the feather happens as the handle is traveling away from the body, you've, you've eliminated that wasted time. So think top edge of the blade to the bow rather than, or toward the finish line, rather than bottom edge of the blade toward the stern. Um, hearing a different perspective can be free speed. Um, I was, I was talking to, to John Graves, uh, who's, who's working with Charlie Butt in, in Boston now, and uh, he, the, the first thing John said about working with Charlie was it's just, it's really interesting to hear the way he thinks about the stroke because it's, it's a different and interesting and, and valuable perspective that I hadn't heard before. Um, John's brother, Peter, uh, before practice one morning, said one of the simplest things that I've, I've ever heard that I think is, I've been using it ever since. Uh, Peter said, you know, what we're really trying to do when we're sculling is get our handles as far away from us as possible, as early as possible, and leave them there for as long as possible. And I got to thinking about that. And when I, when I first heard him say it, I was like, that's, that's almost simple-minded. But then I, the, I, got, I got to playing with it. I was like, no, it's ingenious. Because if you get your handles as far away from you as possible, as early as possible, that really helps you with, with preparation and sequencing on the recovery. It almost guarantees preparation of the body. Um, and leaving your handles as far away from you as possible for as long as possible. People get up to the catch. They want to they 
they want to pull on the handles, they want to bring the handles back toward them right away. If you're thinking about leaving them as far away from you as possible as, for as long as possible, it almost guarantees that you're at least going to, you're going to have a fighting chance at suspending your body weight on the oar handles and following through and, and not giving away part of your arm draw. Um, so different perspectives, different language. Uh, you've, you've heard the same thing a hundred times and somebody says it a little different way and it resonates for you. Um, I'm going to end on this one. Uh, this is this is something Rick said to me one day um, early in my tenure at Craftsbury. He was out watching me skull, and he watched me for quite a while. And I stopped, and he pulled the launch over, and I said, "All right, you know, give me something valuable. Tell me something." He said, "It doesn't look dreamy enough." And then he then he gunned his engine and roared off. And you know, as 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 initially irritating as it was for him to not give me any technical pointer, it's like that that sticks with you. It's like, okay, it doesn't look dreamy enough. Well, what? How how can I how can I skull in a way that looks dreamier? Um, and I I, I guess I've, I've been I've been periodically working on that ever since. Um, so looking dreamy can be free speed if you're if you're putting enough energy into the system. All right, that's uh, that's a wrap for the slideshow. Um, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen if I can ever get my cursor back. There we go. Outstanding. It worked today. Fantastic. All right. Um, Erica, unmute yourself. Tell me what we got. Okay. So the first question came in from, uh, Cheryl and she asked if you have any tips on how to visualize feathering with only the fingers, I feel like I lose control of the handle and end up using my wrist slash palm to square. Um, yes, and I'll start with the, the simplest and first and best feathering and, or best feathering and squaring advice I got. Uh, this, this was at a time when I had uh, bought myself a single and had no regular coaching. Uh, I was rowing out of a university boathouse and of course the university coaches were busy with their collegiate crews and every now and then I'd catch one of them on the dock and I, I knew him because it was UVA and they, they had been my coaches or the coaches of the women's team the year before. And uh, the, um, uh, the, the women's coach was on the dock one day, uh, Howard, and I said, Howard, you know, what, what's up with this, this sculling business? You know, you, I, I, I've been in eights, I've been in fours, you got an inside hand and outside hand what do I do? You know, I get both, both hands have to feather and square. And he said, well, yeah, it's pretty simple. You know, when you go to, when you get ready to square, just close your fingers. And when you get ready to feather, just open your fingers. And I, I, I don't, I, I share that to, to, to send the message of don't overcomplicate it. Don't make it more work than it is. I'm not saying that's going to be the magic dust that is going to fix it for you right away, but keep that in mind and keep coming back to that. The, the pragmatic advice uh, that I have for sort of taking, minimizing the, minimizing the risks in the process is get, get in a single that you can row or maybe in a, in a team boat um, if you don't have access to a single uh, and have somebody else set the boat up for you, but get get in a boat that's stable enough that you don't have to uh, uh, work too much to keep the boat set, and row it without deliberately feathering it. Note, I didn't say on the square. I I, I do think that rowing on the square can be valuable, but I also uh, I have the same bias as a lot of coaches that rowing on the square produces a very unnatural release, but. What, what a lot of coaches and athletes call quarter feather is what I would call just not deliberately feathering. Allow the, allow the blade to turn a little bit as it releases because that's what it wants to do, but don't deliberately feather with either the wrists or the fingers. And when you can get the sense of a comparatively flat wrist while rowing at quarter feather or not deliberately feathering all the way, um, then you, you, you begin to sort of neurologically program that sense of I can release with my wrist relatively flat without really involving the wrist, then it becomes much easier to go on to the next step, 
which is releasing and then allowing the fingers to relax just a little bit and open just a little bit so that the feather happens as a natural process. If, if, if you get a really nice, clean, simultaneous release and you're not gripping the oar handles and you will just let the fingers open a little bit, between the minimal effort of opening your fingers and the water catching the bottom edge of the blade as it, as it leaves the water, feathering becomes very easy. We, we make feathering and squaring much, much, much more work than it needs to be. It should be very little work. The oar lock is square. The sleeve on the, on the oar is square. They want to work together and to be in one of those two 90 degree positions. Don't make it a chore. It doesn't have to be. It'll, it'll clunk into place if you'll let it. Okay, what next? Um, I really liked this question from Susan who says she's new to sculling and she asked if you could just describe what an energetic puddle looks like in the water. Um, the, the simplest answer is that it, it creates a vortex. And I think, you know, almost inevitably, if, if your release isn't just super sloppy and, and you have completely let the drive die, you'll get a puddle with, that, that is relatively energetic, but the tighter you can make that swirl, the, the more energetic the puddle feels. And a, another, another piece of it is that if, if you think that you're getting an energetic puddle, you'll feel that the puddle is energetic, you'll produce an energetic puddle just because that's, that's your goal. Um, the, the practical way to think of it is, uh, you, you want, not, not only do you want that swirling vortex, by the time you get up to take the, the next entry for the blades to take the water for the next stroke, you want that puddle to be far, far past your stern. You, you wanna watch the puddles recede in the distance. So uh, all, all of those things, um, if, if, you, if you even stand on the dock and sort of let the blade come through the water, uh, and I, I see Rick doing this all the time, um, but if, if, you, if you get a blade path that is even remotely like a sculling stroke, it will create a, a nice vortex. And if you do this on a really calm day, that vortex will stay there. Like, you know, you, you have one of those jars of water and you spin the jar and you get the tornado-like vortex. Um, it's, it's kind of fun to do. So, um, play with it. Good luck. Okay. Awesome. So next question from Scott Horney, he asked, uh, if you could talk a little bit about connecting with the water at the front end before you drive versus hitting the, or like how to balance that with hitting the front end too aggressively. He said, don't you need to pressure the blades quickly before you send it? Um, Read the last part of that. Don't you need to says, pressure the blades quickly? What? Don't you need to pressure the blades quickly before you sent it? Is the verbatim question. Um, it's not a simple yes or no question, but I'll, I'll tell I'll tell a couple of stories with with regard to it. Um, one is a swimming analogy. Uh, I was I was coaching a, a woman who was a novice sculler a few years back and um, I, I, I confessed to her that I, I had kind of fallen out of love with the word catch. And be, because of Jim Joy's influence, I had adopted using the word entry instead of catch. And, and Rick, Rick furthered that by, uh, by asking uh, sort of facetiously one day, he's like, how, how can you catch water? You, you ever tried to throw it? Um, so I said, you know, I, I like the word entry. I think it's, I think it's more descriptive. And as a swimmer, she said, well, you know, that's, that's very interesting because in swimming, the entry and the catch are two different things. And that got me thinking about it. And I, I came to the conclusion that, well, you know, maybe, maybe we're oversimplifying this thing. Maybe the entry and the catch are two different things in sculling and rowing as well. And I'm, I'm not a good swimmer, but I'm proficient enough that I can tell that when I'm, when I'm swimming freestyle, if, if I allow the momentum of my body to drive the hand forward as it enters the water, in other words, the hand travels toward the wall before I get hold of the water, I go faster, measurably faster per lap. If I try to grab the water at the catch, 
then I go slower. My, my laps are one or two seconds slower just from making that simple adjustment to understanding that I need to let the momentum of my body be what pushes the hand toward the wall initially, and then I get hold of the water. And do, do I want, once, once, the blade, once the blade or the hand has hold of the water, do I want to load it up pretty swiftly? Yeah, probably. But we, we miss that magical moment because we think, we think we're loading it up when it's still in the air, or we think we're loading it up when it hasn't found the water. There, there is a magic moment, and exactly how many hundredths of a second after that magic moment do you need to load the blade up? I don't know the answer to that question, but it needs to happen after. Um, uh, oh, shoot. Jim Lauderdale, um, former boatman at St. Paul's, Russ Springs cousin and coach at Craftsbury, likes to tell the story of, of the Dutch coach um, whose, whose technical advice to him when he was at Craftsbury was uh, – you put the blade in the water and then you pull. Well, okay, there you have it. The blade has to be in the water before you can load it up. If you try to load the blade before it's in the water, you're, you're gonna grab the water, you're gonna go slower. So that I, if, Scott, if you wanna talk more about that, I'm, I'm happy to, to do so at length or potentially ad nauseum, but uh, I, I, have, I have strong opinions on it. All right, what else have we got? Okay, so Karen Zareski asked if you have any ideas for how to apply power with Dreamy Serenity. Uh, I'll, I'll start by confessing I'm not very good at it, but a word, a word that, uh, that, another word that Pete Graves used that I, I hadn't heard used in the context of rowing and sculling in a long time was the word elastic. Um, we want the stroke to look and feel and be elastic. And if you, are, if you are holding yourself rigidly and tensely, that's not gonna look elastic. It's not gonna look dreamy. It's not gonna feel elastic. It's not gonna feel dreamy. And if, if you watch that 2004 Olympic final or you watch the 2019 World Championship video that I didn't have time to, to delve into, or really any high level uh, international race where people are sculling really well, you know, you can look across the field in a, in a final, especially in the first thousand meters and see exactly what we're talking about when we say we want the stroke to look elastic. It's uh, the, the, the stroke looks more like bouncing a basketball than it looks like dropping a bowling ball. And if you, if you, if you want to look dreamy, think relaxed, think elastic, uh, uh, discard your rigidity. Um, and I, I've, I've been trying to discard my rigidity for years. I haven't quite got there, but uh, some days I, I look a little better than others. Okay. Okay. Um... Next question uh, from Barbara Hogan. I've recently had, or I've recently had a very skilled coach who said there's no pulling without pushing. I understand it to mean that once there is no longer pressure on the feet, don't continue to pull with the arms. Does this conform to an accelerated drive? Absolutely. Um, one, of, one of the things that I, I touched on very briefly and I, I realized that I, I was, uh, I was getting too deep into time and, and that I had misestimated how long it was going to take to go through this slideshow and I wanted to get onto the question. So I, I thank Barbara for this question because it allows me to cover the topic that I didn't want to cover because I thought I was taking too long. Um, you know, the, the drill that a lot of coaches call the uh, reverse pick drill or uh, the turtle drill or um, top quarter, top half, three quarter, full, um, all, all of the drives that, that start with the idea of uh, uh, taking a partial stroke from, from the entry uh, and, and just starting to drive the boat well off the front end, um, typically those are used in order to encourage people to, to uh, engage the hips rather than opening the back too early. At least that's, that's sort of the, the, the classic early reason. 
I, I like to use that sequence and call it the release anywhere drill. Because if you only take 25% of the drive or the top quarter and you have to release the blades, it almost inevitably happens while the blades are still loaded. And what you find out is that it's very, very easy to release the blades from the water if they haven't started to unload. And then you go to, you go to half the drive, you go to top half, and it's still pretty easy because it's pretty easy to keep the blades loaded. Uh, it, it's easy to, to stay, to keep the pins loaded through mid drive. And so the release stays easy. And then you go to three quarters of the drive and maybe you're the, the way that the way that my college coaches framed this was, you know, bring use, use, get, get the back involved and use the arms, bring the arms halfway home. And if you're, if you're accelerating effectively, it's still pretty easy to release the blades. And then you go to full drives. And typically what you find is that people are failing to sustain their suspension and they're trying to keep the blades in the water and row too steep a catch angle because they think that the release, the release has to happen here in the layback position. It's like my, my handles must be here. And the release is not an anatomical imperative. It doesn't have to happen. It doesn't have to happen in the layback position with your, with your thumbs brushing your shirt and at, at, the, at the level of the seventh rib or whatever. The release needs to happen at that magic moment where the blades and the pins and the handles and the stretchers are all still loaded and they have not yet begun to unload. And if you, hang, if you try to hang on to it longer than that, all you're doing is dragging your blades in the water. So, and I, this, this, this lets me, this lets, lets me get to uh, the, the, the rhyme that we tried to, we never finished this rhyme, but we tried to create a rhyme to go with this uh, on the on the trip south to Florida this this year before COVID, and um, Steve started it off by by telling the athletes, you know, it's it's easy to get suspension when when you're still in front of the pins, when your when your handles are still in front of the pins, it's easy to stay suspended. So it's easy to I I, I tried to rhyme it. It's easy to suspend when you're in front of the pin, but the backside must be more dynamic. And then I, I never finished the rhyme. It's like something, 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 don't panic. I don't know. But, uh, you know, keeping, keeping the pins and the blades and the foot stretchers and the handles loaded, uh, it's, it's difficult. And where your release happens, it needs to, what, you, you want to keep them loaded as long as you can, but if you can't keep them loaded anymore, it's time to release. So release there. Um, Barbara, if that didn't answer your question, send me an email and I'll, I'll go on at greater length, but uh, I, I hope it did. Okay. Okay, um, question from Richard asking, if you can recommend a drill that would help to correct a tendency to break or cinch the arms too early during the drive. Uh, yes, get yourself a couple of lengths of PVC pipe that are about three feet long and, and tape your elbows so that your arms have to, I, I'm, 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 I'm not entirely kidding about that. Uh, I, I have resorted with, with people who wanted to not use their wrists to feather and square. You, you, you tape the paint sticks to the, to the forearm so that they can't use their wrists. Um, I, I think that the, the drill that I was just describing is, is useful for that same purpose. If you only perform 25% of the drive, uh, most, most coaches would tell you that 25% of the drive, your arms should have, they, they should still be fully elongated or at the very least, the, the bend in your elbow should be minimal. So doing top quarter with a commitment to leaving the arms long and maybe with, with Peter Graves's admonition of we're trying to leave the handles as far away from us as possible for as long as possible. If you wanna keep those handles away from you, you certainly don't wanna bend your arms trying to bring them back to you. Um, and a, another thing that Peter said on that same topic on that same day was if, if you bend the arms early in the drive, what you're really doing is giving away part of your ability to finish the drive. You want to have quite a bit of arm draw left as you, be, as you begin to run out of, and I, I won't get into the debate of 
how sequential is the drive? How blended is the drive? Exactly, is, should everything finish at the same time? Should the legs finish and then the back finishes? I'm not gonna get into that debate, but I will say that I, I think it's definitively important that you have some arm draw left when you get to the, the back end of the stroke. That's part of what's gonna keep Barbara Hogan and everybody else suspended when they're behind the pin is having that, that arm draw left with which to finish the suspension. If you give it away at the front end, you won't have it at the back end. So top quarter is a really good drill for that. Um, just be, being patient enough to, to just stop. Every time you catch yourself bending your arms, stop, reset, try it again. Um, and another one, another visual image that I'll give, and I'm stealing this one from Rick Ricky, is imagine yourself as a pole vaulter. If, uh, if you get up to the, to the front end and, uh, you know, if, if, if a pole vaulter leaves the ground and immediately tries to pull himself up the pole with his arms, it's not going to be a very successful vault. That vaulter's got to surrender his body weight to, to the pole with, with long arms and suspended on the pole. Turn it 90 degrees horizontally and you've got two less bendy poles, but you still got to surrender your body weight to them. You still got to suspend. And that's best accomplished with uh, long arms, not necessarily straight arms. Straight tends to connote rigidity. And it also, uh, you know, it, if, if, you, if you had a list of all the people who've, who've won the Olympics and the world championships, who have a little bend in their arms as they take the water, well, you'd have Mirka Napkova on there. You'd have uh, Vacheslav Ivanov. You'd have Thomas Longa. You'd have an awful lot of really good scholars. It's not, it's not a cardinal sin to take up the slack with your elbows a little bit, but it is a cardinal sin to try to bring the handles to you right away. Okay. All right. Um, I got a question via email from Anita who asked, any comment about hearing bubbles under the hull as the boat runs? Yes, it's fun. Pay attention to it. Okay. Um, I, I think, I, I don't, I, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna make any prescriptive pronouncements about the sound of the hull, but I, I do think, I, I will put in a plug for engaging your other senses. Um, one of the, one of the things that, I, I hadn't heard Rick say this until recently, but a couple, it's been a couple of years that Rick's been saying, the, the, the central problem of sculling is that we're looking the wrong direction. And, you know, on the face of it, that's funny because it's literally true. We're looking, we're not looking where we're going, but that's not what he's saying. What he's, what he's really getting at more is, is more the neurological aspect of human beings are sort of neurologically programmed to have their bodies go in the direction that they're looking. And if you are constantly looking at the starting line you're not thinking as much about the finish line as you should be. And you've got to develop a Boward consciousness. And one way to develop a Boward consciousness, if you have the luxury of having somebody who can watch you from a launch and keep you from running into things, or you have the luxury of a big enough and empty enough body of water is close your eyes and start listening and feeling. Engage your other senses. We, we trust our eyes too much and our eyes fool us. Our eyes are probably I, I don't want to say they're the weakest tools we can use, but don't, don't let your eyes be a crutch. Listen to the boat, listen to the oars, listen to the puddles. Um, feel the boat, feel the oars, feel the puddles. Um, listen to the bubbles under your hull, it's fun. All right. Okay, um, I guess I have one more question, which we received via email prior to the chat, but I assume they still want their question answered. So the question is, as the stroke rating goes up, how to think about keeping the slide slow. Um, if you're really committed to and successful with the suspend and send rhythm and you get a clean release, the rhythm of the recovery is going to take care of itself. Um, you know, if, if, you're, if you're racing at 40 strokes a minute, you can't achieve a two to one drive to recovery ratio. It can't be done. The blades stay in the water long enough that you, you don't have that much time to get back up the slide. Uh, but if, if you're really getting the rhythm 
on the drive, the recovery will take care of itself. Um, you're trying to you're trying to give the boat as much space to run out as you can. But you know your job on the recovery is well, it's, it's the three R's: the rest, reposition, and run. The boat is running. You want it to continue. You don't want to do anything to disturb the run of the boat. Um, uh, rest, you've got an opportunity, you should take advantage of it, and reposition, um, your, your sole job on the recovery really is to get yourself back in the position that you need to be in to make the next drive as effectively as you possibly can. And if, if, you, get the, if you get the rhythm of the drive and, and release right, the recovery will take care of itself and you, you won't be rushing. You, you won't be spending a lot of time on the slide because at 40 strokes a minute, Blades stay in the water for seven, eight, nine tenths of a second. You're going to have about a one to one, one to one ratio uh, if you're committed to to the less to more drive. Okay. Do you have time for one more? Um, I do, but I I'm I'm actually tired of hearing myself talk. And based on the based on the dwindling number of people who are still here, and thank you for for uh, your perseverance, folks. But uh, um, yeah, I think this this should be. For the sake of, of uh, mercy, if nothing else, this should be the last question. So lay it on me. Okay. Okay. Last one from Guy is, should one think dropping the blades in the water at the catch or rather forcing them into the water? Well, yeah, definitely not the latter. Um, for, there was, uh, I, I don't know whom to cite. I know it was a Seattle-based lightweight male single sculler in the 90s who said this but uh at, at the time that i first heard it it didn't make any sense to me but he, he called the catch dead time he said you know i i don't i don't want anything happening at the catch it's just you know everything's been flowing one way it's about to flow the other way and the boat's in motion I want to have absolutely nothing to do at the moment of the catch. And, you know, that's, that's usually part of our, if, if I give the doc talk on the recovery, I always, I always hit that point really hard. The reason for early body preparation, the reason for early blade preparation, the reason for uh, getting your, your shoulders relative to your hips, uh, getting, getting, getting your, uh, getting your hips bowward of your shoulders um, so that you're in a powerful position. You want to have all of that done as early as possible in the recovery, uh, which is not to say you should rush it, but it is to say that if you can get it done earlier, then you won't have anything left to do at the moment of the catch other than let gravity put your blades in the water for you. If you are still thinking about, I got to prepare my body. Oh, I got to reach a little more. Uh, and by the way, we're, 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 we're on the verge of banning the word reach around here because of the connotation of, of using the arm and the hand and the shoulder. Um, if, if you're thinking about doing anything at the catch other than letting the blades fall in the water while the boat is on the, on the run, you've, you've given yourself too much to do. How, how often in your life do you have multiple things to do at the same time and get them all done in a very uh, perfect way. You know, can, can you bring real craftsmanship to three tasks that you are trying to perform at the same time? Absolutely not. Um, so, and, and, but bonus tip, uh, the, the thing that has helped me the most besides that image of, of the swimmer and of the hand being, being driven forward toward the wall as the, by the momentum of the body and that being analogous to the to the blade finding the water and and as the blade finds the water it's moving toward the finish line and toward the direction that the boat wants to go before it gets loaded up um somebody took some video of me sculling about five years ago and i thought i was sculling just near perfectly and i was appalled when i saw it because it was a stern shot and by the time my blades actually took the water my hands were back almost inside the gunnels and so i'd missed a whole bunch of the drive and so for the next six weeks, I, I had one thought and one thought only, which was, I want to try to feel my blades finding the water while my hands or while my handles are still moving out around the arcs. And it's, it's 
one of, one of the reasons that catch timing is so tricky is that the boat is running and when, when your blades take the water, if you have been missing water for years, your blades take the water and your first thought is, oh, that happened before I was ready for it and I didn't like that because the water tried to take my blades away from me. Yes, it did. And that's the way you're getting closer to a, to a, to a good catch timing, but you thought it was wrong, so you went back to your habit because rowing air makes you feel comfortable. You feel longer and you feel more in your natural habit. So catch timing is really tricky. And a lot of times when you improve your catch timing, it's gonna feel very weird for a while. And you need to let it feel weird and maybe even feel awkward and maybe even feel wrong. Um, if, if you can see from video or somebody can see from shore or a launch that you're getting the blade in at a, at a slightly steeper angle and, and not rowing it in, uh, you're, you're doing it better than you were. So uh, definitely don't force the blade in. The blade, let, let gravity do the work for you. And, and uh, I could, I could in, in 15 seconds, tell the, the famous story that Mike Tatey tells on himself all the time about screaming at his eight to, to then this being an Olympic eight, get your blades in and get on it. I need a quicker catch. And it got sloppier and sloppier. And finally he stopped him and said, you know, show me something else show me anything else no wait what i want is a slower more patient catch show me a slower more patient catch and they took off again and he got a he got a better timed catch he got a quicker catch by asking for a slower catch he got a quicker catch you say quicker the athlete thinks okay i gotta force this to happen you say slower more patient the athlete lets the blade drop in he didn't have any way of knowing that it was going to work before he said it the fact that it did work we're looking at it in hindsight but some, sometimes you just got to try something different for your catch timing. All right. Um, thanks, everyone. This, this went on a little bit longer than, than anticipated. But if you're still here, it must be because you're still interested enough to, to stick around. Or maybe you're cooking dinner and not paying any attention to the screen anymore at all. But uh, it's, it's been a blast. We'll have, uh, we'll have Marlene Royal next week um, talking about uh, flexibility and, and uh, movement patterns and producing more uh, comfort for master's scholars as we age. Uh, and um, yeah, it'll, it'll, be, uh, it'll be outstanding. And week after that, we're gonna have strength coach Will. And uh, the week after that, I think it uh, may, may be Steve Welpley. Uh, that's the hope, we'll, um, but we'll announce those as they come. Um, thanks very much. I've, I've had fun. I hope you have. And um, again, uh, thanks for being part of the webinar. I'm going to end this call. We can all wave goodbye. And next week, we actually had somebody contribute outro music. I've been, I've been making that joke for three weeks or four weeks now. and We're going to have outro music next time. All right. <laughs>